אופניים. doing a lot of things during these two weeks. In particular, they will be co-teaching one of the three courses of this week. So the course uh, Introduction to Ergodic Theory, they will co-teach. And they will also be key figures with all of us in the tutorial sessions. So let me say a little bit about the structure of the day, as you might have seen from the program. We have three hours of lectures each day, one by Hannah, one by me, and one by the tutors this week, and by Amy next week. And then the morning goes into lectures. After lunch, at 2 p.m. every day, we will reconvene here in this room for exercises, essentially. So we will each give two exercises each day on uh, the problems. And I want to stress, as Stefano said, in the evenings and in the weekend, you will have plenty of time to do tourism or to explore the city. We hope to see you here in the morning, but even more important, we really hope to see you. We expect you to be here every afternoon and try to work on the problems, because really, you should know this already. You don't learn mathematics if you don't do things. So you can listen, you can hear, but you really need to do uh, problems and there will be some very easy problems for everybody just to work out to digest in the concepts if they're new to you maybe some more challenging for who wants more challenge but uh, how we will explain you more at 2 p.m. today how it will work but it will really be time for you to, to try to solve something and our tutors and ourselves will be in the room to go around and help you and give you hints or advice or <laughs> but it's really important and finally, uh, as you see, this is really a school. It's not a conference. We will have a poster session next Monday. And I very much encourage all of you, if you haven't thought, uh, I hope many of you will present a poster next week, either on their research or just a topic that they've studied and they learn if you're younger. It's a really a good opportunity for you. But uh, we won't have a, a really a conference. So one key thing in these two weeks it's also our evening activities. So we decided, it's a little bit an experiment for us also, we had decided to put ourselves into the game of sharing with you some of our experiences, maybe give you some advice, maybe chatting with you and try to listen to what are your questions, your, your doubts. So there will be a series of activities which are kind of career development or uh, about uh, uh, transferable skills and kind of developing you into uh, a researcher or mathematician in all rounded aspects. So today we will have some socializing activities and uh, there will be also a reception with some drinks. And uh, tomorrow we will also have some socializing activity uh, for female or gender minorities. With groups, we will explain it day by day. And then there will be a presentation of ICTP and uh, um, uh, OVST, but we, we will see in the program. Another important part will be panel discussions. There will be a panel discussion this week, another panel discussion next week around topics like uh, being a PhD student, a successful PhD, applying for jobs as a PhD or a postdoc, being, becoming an independent researcher, so there will be different kind of activities geared this week more to the younger participants, next week maybe a little bit more to the more senior participants, but hopefully everybody can get some advice at all stages of your career. Okay, so I think this is all for what I wanted to say about the program.
and it's time to start. So because I'm the first, I will start with some basic introduction on dynamical systems because I know there are some people in the school that maybe have seen more, maybe people, there are some experts that maybe should not be here. <laughs> but this week is really for people who are new to dynamical systems. And we want to start from the very basics and give you hopefully really a good idea of some of the basic key ideas. So first of all, let me write dynamical systems. So what are dynamical systems? Dynamical just means systems which are changing, are changing with time, okay? So anything in evolution, which could be anything from the weather, which is changing, molecules of gas in a box, or the financial market, or a population in biology, all of these are dynamical systems. And so first of all, am I writing big enough for the last row? Can you steal this? Should I like bigger? Bigger? OK, good. So dynamical systems can be pure and applied. And it goes really the whole way of the spectrum. They can be very pure. They can be very applied. And uh, okay, let me say, because uh, change in time. And often, they are chaotic. And we will see. And uh, as you said, applied dynamical systems, maybe I can say they can be uh, in a, in a uh, they can, OK. Applied systems come from physics, from economics, from biology, from, uh, what did I forget, astronomy, historically planetary motion, and so on, and so on, and so on. And they can be extremely applied, but they can also be uh, very pure, and they are kind of an active research area which sits between, in some sense, analysis. We will see some measure theory will come into play this week. But they also have uh, geometry. They also have interaction with uh, number theory. and also combinatorics and probability. So as you see, and I can still put dots here. So actually, one of the things which fascinated myself when I was an undergraduate student and I learned about dynamical system is really how interdisciplinary the theory of dynamical system is and how many tools from different areas of pure mathematics are used. So this is really what I, lo I like about dynamical system. And I really use, I really use, for example, geometry, probability, analysis. So there are connections with number theory. So it's really rich. So if you were interested in this part, I'm going to disappoint you because we will really not go into any applied dynamical system in these two weeks. We will really stay kind of on this side of the blackboard. But if you're interested in that side, you will learn a good foundation. So you will learn the basic theory and some basic concepts that hopefully one day could help you in study very concrete models. We will stay on more the pure side. And again, dynamical systems have two other uh, aspects. They can be discrete or they can be continuous. Ah. OK, so what does it mean discrete and continuous? It refers to time evolution. So here, time moves in discrete units. First, this is already too small, probably. Is it, can you still read something like this? Yes. So here, time, and actually my n is the Italian n. So time in the time evolution is measured into uh, integer. Time intervals could be minutes, seconds, years. But you look at discrete pictures of your system. And uh, in the continuous picture, instead, time moves into uh, continuous. So the time is a real number. OK? So here, the motion is encoded by points. Here, the motion by being encoded by trajectories moving continuously. And uh, 
uh, again, in mathematically, this means iterations of a map. We will. And this means orbits or trajectories of a flow or solutions of a differential equation. Trajectories of a flow or solutions of an ODE, for example, a PDE. ODE. And again, about these two words, so we said we will more be on the pure side, and we will really mostly focus on discrete for, I think, all two weeks. Maybe we will, at some point, mention continuous, but then reduce it to discrete. So again, we will not say much about those. And uh, now what is a discrete dynamical system for us? A discrete dynamical system, as I said, is just a map, F, from a space X into itself, okay? So, and you should think of this map as describing, this is your system, so X is the system, and F, so a point X in your space, is the initial condition, and F describes the time evolution. I will give you a basic example in a second. F is the time evolution. So if you look at F of X, this is the system after system after one unit of time. One unit of time. And okay, maybe I will start erasing this side. So if I apply my map F, it tells me how my quantity of interest is changing in a discrete time unit. So for example, you could think uh, that X is the interval 0, 1, and F is, I don't know, let me say this map that I will not use again, but Instead, I will not do anything applied, but I will start with an example which is motiv motivated by applied word, maybe. No, not only, but. Okay, so for example, it could be 0, 1, and this map, if you plot it, it's a parabola, down facing parabola, with the top at one half. And this map is actually called, uh, it's in the logistic family, it's a critical logistic map. And x, you can think of this x as the percentage. For example, this is a model used in biology. You could think that you have a population of some species which changes with time. And there is, I don't know, n is the maximum population capacity if you have an environment. And I don't know. X times N is the time, uh, the individuals in your populations. And F of X, I don't know, could, could be X of a million butterflies that your greenhouse can contain. And then F of X is just a population after, I don't know, one day. Okay? In this sense, it describes the evolution of your system. And you could encode with a variable, whichever quantity you want to study, and with some function, whichever time evolution describes your future variable. And now some very basic definition that, again, I'm sure I'm boring some people, but there are some people who have not seen dynamical systems, so you need to start from somewhere. So what are you interested in? You're interested in orbits. Okay, so we said we have x, f of x. After two units of time, we have f square of x, which from now on we will denote f 
of f of x. And in general, as a notation, when I write fn of x, so in this course, in dynamical systems, always fn is not a power, is not a derivative, and derivative fn is the nth composition. So fn always means f composed with f, composed with f, n times. Okay? So, uh, and if f, yes, yes. Sorry? One minus x, absolutely. Thank you. People are paying attention. Good. <laughs> So please, so any comment that you have, any question at any time, I'm happy to, for you to interrupt. If it's an easy question, I'm very, it's very good to answer immediately. If it's a longer question, maybe we discuss later, but do feel free to interrupt, okay? And pick up typos, which you can always. Okay, and if f is invertible, so if you can invert it, you can also write f minus n, which is the composition of the inverse n times. <clears throat> and then with this notation, so the forward orbit of an initial condition of a point, I will denote it at O f plus, so orbit of the map f in the future, the orbit of the point x, this is the collection of f, f of x, dot, 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 fn of x, dot, 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 as n varies among natural numbers. Okay? <clears throat> so this is the recording of future states of your system as time goes by in discrete units. Okay? And the key question, so okay, maybe stupid, okay. Uh, if you look at my map and you take, I don't know, three fourths, you start at three fourths, you apply four x times one minus x, which is the right one, and you get uh, four, thir four thirds times one minus three fourths times one fourth, so this is uh, four thirds times one minus uh, three fourths is one fourth, so you get uh, one third. Did I do it right? Ah, yes, okay, one third, and then so on, so on, so on. You just apply your map. Uh, maybe I had written one third on my notes, so I have different numbers, okay. Uh, So what do we want to know about our time evolution? So one basic question is to try to understand what is the nature of these orbits. For example, you could ask, does there exist any fixed point? So any fixed point, this is a point, an initial condition which does not change under time. Is there a state which is invariant, time invariant? Or you could ask if there exists, sorry, this, uh, this is, does there exist a symbol? There exists a question mark, a periodic orbit. So the next, you might not have a point which is fixed, but you may have a point which, i.e., that means the, a point x uh, such that there exists a time n for which Fn of x is equal to x. Okay. There is this the point that after finitely many, many steps comes back. And in this case, the orbit is finite. In the sense that in this case, you see the same finitely many values repeating it. In this, you can, you can write an infinite list but the infinite list consists by finitely many things repeated over and over again. Okay. Okay. 
I tend to speak fast. Yes, there is a question. This is supposed, this definitions work for any function on any space. Huh? You can apply to the same example, but in general, it's the questions that you ask for any. Yes? Yes. Yes. Ah, I said, my David, did I do it wrong? It's very possible. Uh, 4x, uh, I did it. It's actually a fixed point. I think, okay. Let me correct the example, which shows that I think 3 fourths is the periodic point, the, the, the fixed point. Yes, I think I did it silly myself. Uh, I cannot compute this. No. Okay. Okay, sorry. So I think the example, I, let me write. So I want you to do one third. One third goes into four thirds minus uh, one minus one third, which is eight, nine. And this one you can keep going, then I don't know. The next one, it's uh, 32, 81, and so on. And this, I think it's an infinite one. And if you indeed, if you compute in the example, in the example, I think f of three fourths was indeed three-fourths. So this is indeed the fixed point of my map. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, do complain if I... <laughs> OK. So you can ask these questions, but you can also ask the opposite. And these are somehow the simplest orbit. orbits. Fixed points or periodic points are as simple as one can hope for. At the farthest end, you can actually ask if there exists a dense orbit. So what does it mean? And maybe let's put it as a definition, but it's a little bit vague definition at this stage. Uh, o f plus x is dense. It's not, OK, I will tell you. If it gets arbitrarily close to any points in your space, so to say this arbitrary close, you actually need your space X to be a metric space, to have a notion to measure distances, which I'm kind of skipping now. If you think of your example of 0, 1, it's clear what close means. So it's that's if for every other point in the space and for every epsilon, positive number, that's how we measure closeness, uh, there exists an N such that uh, Fn of x is epsilon close to y. And to say this, you need a distance. So you need a notion of distance. So for example, in uh, 0, 1, this uh, simply means that uh, Fn of x minus y is less than epsilon, OK? OK, so these are points which may, you cannot hope that you go everywhere, but you can hope that you go arbitrarily close to everywhere. And there's lots in between. There can be lots in between, or cannot, it depends. There could be situations where you're not periodic, but you're not dense. So maybe you are confined in some part of your space, maybe. <laughs> and. Uh, even if you are dense, it's not the end of the game. You can ask much more. You can ask, if I plot an orbit and it goes close to everywhere, how will it spread? Will it actually be equidistributed? So I will just write it without defining it, because we will see this later this week, more formally. You can ask if it's equidistributed, which intuitively you expect means it spends equal amount of times in equally large parts of space. Is it equidistributed? And let me keep it vague. Maybe we will define it tomorrow for the rotation, and certainly maybe David will do it in equidistributed. I don't know. We will, ergodicity, you will see later ergodicity and more formal way to make this precise. OK. 
These are very basic questions. So I just wrote the logistic map because I wanted to tell you something about, you can think this is the population in a biology model, and if you haven't seen dynamical systems, it gives you the idea of time evolution. But again, we will not do applications, so the logistic map will not do our main, will not be our main example. But let me tell you what will be two further examples this week. So example two, which is also not going to be my example, but it's going to be Hanam starting example, or main example, no? Is, let me stay on zero one for another little bit. Uh, this is just the following map. F of x, which is two x, if uh, x is less than one half, and two x minus one, if s is greater than one half. So if you plot it, this map goes from zero to one in the first half, and again, from zero to one in the second half. It's a piecewise defined map. And this is called the doubling map. And let me write two maps now. I will also write the rotation in the zero one setting. This is example two, and this is example three. Again, let's stay on zero one for not much longer. And let me fix a parameter, alpha, between zero and one. And then the map, uh, I will call it R of x, maybe R alpha of x. This is just uh, x plus alpha if x is less than one minus alpha, and x plus alpha minus one, if x is greater or equal than one minus alpha. So if you plot it, it's also, in this picture, it's the piecewise map. So let's say alpha is large or small. Uh, So this is alpha, its identity shifted from alpha. So its identity, this is x plus alpha. And here, from one minus alpha to one, you go back to zero and just the time to get to a height alpha, okay? <clears throat> and this is gonna be a rotation in zero one. So these two maps, first of all, uh, it will be our, our main examples, at least at the beginning of this week. And they might look maybe similar to you, but they are actually very different. So can anybody tell me what according to you is some, some difference between these two maps? Some feature which is different? What is different? What, is, what do you think is the main difference between these two maps? Uh, yes, the other one, well, depends on alpha, it could have fixed points, if, uh, alpha is not zero. Okay, good point, alpha is, this one, one has fixed point, the other doesn't, good one. More differences, yes? Very good difference, exactly. One is invertible, one is not. And I can even add more, this is actually two to one, uh, and it's not invertible because it's two to one, so two points are two pre images, and this is actually one to one, and it's indeed invertible, one to one. More differences. Yes? Pick up a little bit. In isometry, this is a good, really good one. So this is, and I, it's actually, let's write it here. Uh, piecewise isometry, but it is in isometry, but you have to be careful of which distance, okay. Piecewise isometry. So actually the derivative is one. It's identity with translations, okay. And what about this one? It's not an isometry. Which feature does it have? Uh, uh, 
Yes, that's really the key difference. It took, all the others are very true, but this one is piecewise expanding. Expanding. Which really means that the derivative is strictly greater than one at every point. Okay? And thank you. So all these two, I think of them, are really at the heart of why these two maps have very different dynamical features. And um, the doubling map is really kind of the model of, first of all, piecewise expanding maps. And this is what uh, Hannah will be telling us all about this week. She will go to also the nonlinear case. And uh, next week, we will see hyperbolic dynamical systems in Hannah and Amy's course. And somehow, the doubling map is at the heart also of the hyperbolic dynamical world. So if you have in one dimension, you just have space for expansion. In higher dimension, you have space for expansion and contraction. But uh, somehow, this is uh, the feature of the hyperbolic world. If you know what that means, you know. If you don't know, you will learn. But uh, so, and this map is, in some sense, very chaotic. The most chaotic map that you can have. It has lots of periodic orbits. It has lots of dense orbits. And it has lots of intermediate features between dense and, and chaotic. And it also has this sensitive dependence on initial condition, which you might have heard about the butterfly effect. If you change your x a little bit, your future evolution can be completely different. Okay? So this is like the prototype of a very chaotic map. And again, Hannah will kind of push towards this probably. Well, she will tell you about piecewise expanding. She will tell you some key ideas of dynamics starting from this map, like symbolic coding and structural stability. Am I right, uh, Hannah? Yeah. <laughs> You will say more. So from now on, I will ignore this map and leave it to Hannah. And my favorite map is really the rotation. And this is a key example if you want to study entropy zero. So I'm using this word, but I don't assume that any, well, some people know what entropy is. And then, you know, you, I'll tell you, this is entropy zero. If you don't know what entropy means, ignore it. We will not do entropy in this course. But what I want to say, this is low complexity. So it's in some sense, it's much more predictable than uh, the doubling map. But nevertheless, it does have some chaotic features. It does have, for example, ergodicity, we will see. And uh, next week, we, in the really piecewise isometry, it's a key feature. And next week, we will generalize this into interval exchange maps and the world of piecewise isometry of the interval. So this will be our model this week. And the key idea that I want to do this week is really to explain some basic features of renormalization. So the way to study these low complexity systems involves a key idea in dynamics, which is the one looking at your system on a very small scale and like having some other dynamics which acts as a zooming lens to study the system of different scales. So what my goal for this week will be is to uh, explain renormalization for rigid rotations for these maps. And uh, we will go tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, to the Gauss map and continued fractions and see them as a mechanism to renormalize these maps. OK, so these two words, Hannah and Amy, myself, we will split these two weeks like this. And uh, I think I have time to say uh, a little bit more. So I started with 0, 1. But in reality, these two maps can be both seen as maps of the circle. And let me say that we have circle in the title of uh, this week. So a more compact way to write this map is actually just f of x. Can you see orange, or can you see these different colors? You can write it as 2x mod 1. So let me remind you, mod 1 means simply uh, ignore the integer part. So mod 1 just means remove integer part. So for example, if you take 
3.14 mod 1. The integer part is 3, and this is 0 0.14, OK? Mod 1. And similarly here, you can write this map more compactly as R alpha of x is x plus alpha mod 1. But another question. This corner is bad, I assume. Is it bad? Can you see this corner? You can see the corner. OK, no problem then. So you see, every time your output is greater than 1, you want to remove 1 in this case, so that you're back into 0, 1. OK? Your map maps to 0, 1. It's always have to be less than 1. And when you overshoot, you remove 1. And indeed, both these maps are maps of the circle. And if you read the title of our um, conference, this first week it's called a circle of concepts in dynamics. And this was a pun that Amy suggested, because we'll work on the circle and we'll tell you a circle of concepts of basic ideas. So, so our space, uh, it's nicer. Instead of thinking of x being 0, 1, it's a little better to think that x is the unit circle. So let me introduce just the unit circle. So this notation, S1, if you haven't seen it, is just the circle of uh, radius 1 in the plane. So you can think of it as the space of x, y, such that x squared plus y squared is equal to 1 as a subset of R2. And you can also think of it as cosine of 2 pi theta, comma, sine 2 pi theta. That's how you parameterize points on the circle where theta is a parameter, angle parameter, between 0 and 1. Okay? So I can parameterize it with the angle parameter theta and write these points on the circle as cosine sine. Okay? So this is the circle. And sometimes it's also useful to think of the circle as a subset of the complex plane. So you can think of it as complex numbers. So you can write it as a Z in C, complex number of modulus equal to 1. And this is the same than saying, uh, the same than saying that Z, you can write it as e to the 2 pi i theta. So this is cosine of 2 pi i theta plus i sine of 2 pi, no, 2 pi theta, sorry plus i sine of 2 pi theta. And this again is a 0 less or equal than, I can put less or equal here, less or equal than theta less than 1. OK, in complex coordinates or in a real plane. And this two, the circle is not so much different from an interval. So if you take your circle and cut it open, and straighten it, you get an interval. So what you should think that this S1 is actually the unit interval 0, 1 in this angle coordinates. I'm just wrapping a unit interval around my circle, but I need to glue 1 with 0. So it's just a unit interval with an identification, which I like, we write like this, 0, 1 modulo tilde where tilde just means tilde just means that 0 is glued to 1. So 0 and 1 are the same point, OK, with glued endpoints. Really, take your circle, cut it open, and you have an interval, but you have to remember that these two points were the same on the circle. And alternatively, another, if you like, equivalence classes, this is R mod Z. So it's real number modulo the integers. So this is the space of equivalence classes of the form x plus z, where x is a real number. And this equivalence classes means what? That you take everything up to integers. So x plus z is equal to y plus z, exactly when 
x minus y is an integer. <coughs> okay, so you can think instead. First of all, one more time. Can you all see the bottom? Everybody, you can use everything in the board and you're all happy. Good, otherwise complain. Or otherwise, sit in front, because it's nice to have people in front, okay? So don't sit too far away. If you sleep, I don't care, but I hopefully I shout enough to keep people awake, but maybe I also go too fast and people fall asleep, or too slowly, too boringly, but I don't get offended. Okay. And, sorry, we have to do, I want to make sure that everybody is on our same step, so. Maybe you've seen this many times, maybe not, so it's good to. So can I just have a reality check? How many people have, have uh, seen the circle? Or how many people have seen, okay, the circle? Good, essentially everybody. Okay, how many people have seen doubling maps before? Seen a lot, okay, not everybody. Uh, how many people have st st seen rotations before? Almost everybody, okay. How many people have seen uh, continued fractions before? Mm. Yeah, quite a lot, cool. do the opposite. How many people have not seen continued fractions? Is it true? Okay, it's very few. And how many people have seen the Gauss map? Uh, I need the opposite. How many people have not seen the Gauss map? Okay, I think that we, maybe we can speed up a little bit <laughs> tomorrow class at least. Okay, so how am I doing with time? I still have 10, 15, 15 minutes probably, right? I'm going until nine? No, I'm going until 10? There's no Stefano anymore. Hannah, I'm going until 10, right? Perfect, okay, so let me then say something. Let me write a theorem and let me write our first theorem about, uh, okay, we have the circle. Let me write our first theorem about rotations. Uh, ah, first of all, maybe one more comment. So R alpha, the map that I wrote in zero one, on the circle is maybe very simple. It's just counter clock, counter clock, clockwise, rotation, by two pi alpha angle. So this x plus alpha uh, mod one is doing nothing else than taking a point z and rotating it to this. So x plus alpha, so maybe if you write it in complex notation, uh, r alpha is two pi i theta. If I had an angle theta, what is happening is just I'm adding two pi theta plus alpha. I'm adding alpha modulo one, okay? So this is just multiplying two pi, but here I miss an i, two pi i theta to e, this is exponential of two pi i theta. And this is e to the two pi i alpha times e to the two pi i theta. So this I multiply by a complex number of modulus one and phase alpha, okay? <coughs> it's useful to know also the complex uh, version. And on the circle, really the rotation is an isometry. And if you want to think of it as an isometry of zero one, you need to pick the right distance. So you need to remember that zero and one were glued together on the circle. So you need to remember that on zero one you want a distance that tells you that zero and one are close to each other. So you need to take a distance modulo one, okay? So now I can write this first theorem is this dichotomy. The first thing you want to know about rotation is this dichotomy. So there are only two possible behaviors for uh, rigid rotation. And it really depends on the rotation number. It really depends on this angle alpha that you are adding. So there are two situations. 
I'm looking at R alpha from S1 to S1. Either alpha is rational, either the rotation number is rational, and then what happens? Yes, for every uh, uh, Z in S1, the orbit of Z is finite. And actually, not only that, and uh, our alpha to the Q is the identity map. So all points have the same po periods. All points are periodic with the same period. Okay? That's the first case. Very easy. For example, if I rotate by pi fourth, after four rotations, my circle is back to itself, point-wise. Or, the second case is much more interesting. Alpha is irrational. And then, for every point in the circle, the orbit of every point is dense. So, the other case, whichever orbit I plot, it will fill the circle, okay, densely. And there's nothing spurious, there's nothing else in between. There's nothing which is not neither dense nor periodic. Okay, so this is really the starting point from a rotation. So now I want to know also how many people have seen this theorem before and how many people can prove it. Okay. So I think I will not prove, I think we will see the proof, but uh, let's see, 10 minutes. I think it's enough to start at least if we want. Okay, so first of all, the first part I will not prove. Or maybe we can write one line, okay. Proof. First part is just, if alpha is p over q, if I write it both one, r alpha of x, r alpha to the q of x, I just to add q times p over q and take the result modulo one. But q and q simplifies and x plus p Modulo one is identity for every x, okay? So if I add p over q, q times, I go back to where I started. <clears throat> okay, so the real thing to prove is that if I take uh, a point Okay, part two. I want to prove part two. So I take alpha irrational. And here there is a first step. Step one. Which is just that this orbit has, has infinitely many points. Infinitely many points. So this orbit will never close up. So this is the first step. This is my claim. And we can check it by contradiction. So if not, imagine that there exists there exist a K and L such that X plus K alpha mod one is equal to x plus L alpha mod one. <clears throat> Imagine that there are two points when I rotate. So this is R alpha to the K of x, and this is R alpha to the L of x. So imagine that there are two points which are the same. 
then what? That means mod one, it means that there exists an integer such that x plus k alpha uh, plus n is equal to x plus L alpha. Now we can simplify x and we can solve for alpha and I can solve for alpha unless that alpha is, okay, I have a minus, doesn't matter, n times k minus L. And here I'm using that k is different than L. So I have two distinct points which become the same. But what's the, what's the problem here? Huh? Exactly, but this means that alpha is rational. This is a rational number, contradiction. This is a contradiction. So for two points to become the same, I can only, it can only happen if my rotation number is, is uh, uh, rational. If my rotation number is irrational, all points will be distinct. Okay? <clears throat> and now I don't know how fast, I don't want to go too fast. So the step two is the key one. So who can tell me the pigeonhole principle or the shoebox principle? Anybody has heard of that? Anybody knows what the pigeonhole says? No? Huh? Pick up because I... There is? Well, I don't know, if you, for the rotation, there is the Riclet theorem, which is based, I think, oh, I really call, this is a very basic principle, that if you have n boxes and n plus one shoes, you need to put two shoes in the same box. Or if you have n pigeons and n cages and n plus one pigeons, you need to put two pigeons in the same cage. So n boxes plus n plus one objects implies that uh, you need to put, you need at least one box. There exists a box with two objects. Okay? There exists a box with two objects. <clears throat> so I think I will do step two and then leave you to think about the proof. I don't want to do too much solving, so if you haven't seen, and many of you haven't seen the proof, I will do step two and then leave you to finish and give you the solution tomorrow. So let's do step two. Step two is that I claim by step one, so I don't know, so, I want, so let me say, uh, okay, let me say that I fix an epsilon, and this epsilon is what I will use later to, to prove density. And then I can find an n such that one over n integer number is less than epsilon, okay? And now I look at uh, z, r alpha, sorry, I'm doing x or z, it doesn't matter, let's do, let's do, let's write, sometimes I write z if I think of it as a complex number, sometimes I, th I write x if I think of it as zero, one, but we can, okay. Look at z, r alpha, of z up to r alpha to the n of z. And then look at the unit circle. So I have, how many points do I have? This piece of orbit, it's an orbit of length n plus one. This has n plus one distinct, distinct points. And this is crucial because for a rational rotation, I could run back to the same point. But for an irrational, this by step one will be all different points. 
So I have n plus 1 distinct points. And then I'm going to divide my circle into capital N equal parts. And the claim is that by pigeonhole, if I divide my circle into capital N boxes, so here I have N equal arcs, and N plus 1 points, well, there must be an arc which contains two of them, pigeonhole. So by pigeonhole, there exists a K and L with a zero, well, yeah, from one less than K, different than L, less than capital N. Uh, what, uh, maybe I should do, I'm sorry, nobody complains. I start, this is one, I need to do N plus one points. I need n plus 1 because this is 1. No. Oh, no, 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 that was correct. This is 1, 2, yes, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, this is between, uh, then these go from 0, actually. That's the one. Because r alpha to the 0 is like identity. Maybe I should have said that. By convention, r alpha to the 0 is identity. So this is r alpha to the 0 of z, which is identity. Okay, there exists K and L such that uh, R alpha K uh, of Z and R alpha L of Z are epsilon close. Well, epsilon close is in the arc length. So the arc between them uh, in arc lengths. The angle, angle, so basically uh, if you want this angle the angle is less than 2 pi epsilon, okay? And I will stop here because I think it's time for me to stop. But also, this is a good point for me to stop. The, the exercise, the, the theorem is not proven yet. I just found two points which are very close, epsilon close. And I want to use this to show that the orbit of Z is dense. So it will get very close to any other point on the circle. And I think it's very good if I don't do it today. And I will actually ask you to think about it. So if you have seen it, great. But if you haven't seen it, I think it's a good thing to try to do. And then we will solve it tomorrow. It will be conclude that uh, uh, the orbit under R alpha of Z is dense. Okay. There is still one more step to do. Using one of the properties of the rotation that we mentioned, was mentioned today, okay? So try, in the afternoon you will try, okay? Great, so I'm happy to stop. Thanks. So, um,